All right, so while, while people are still sort of drafting in, uh, let's start by asking if there are any more questions from last time. Yeah, Victoria? Yeah, that's right. So there's no, there's no canonical code subspace in general. You can, the way quantum error correction works is you pick a subspace and then you ask what are its error correcting properties. And uh, depending on the problem you're interested in, you might pick a code subspace, different code subspace. And we'll actually see, maybe not until next time, that there's kind of a close relationship between the choice of code subspace and the choice of renormalization scale, which is another thing where we often say those, those words, you know, you kind of, you pick it based on the question that you're asking. And that would also be a choice uh, as to uh, which shape gets followed up by the Well, you don't have a choice about that. So yeah, so the, you know, the, so each state in the CFT has to have a unique bulk interpretation. That, that's kind of the difference between this and Papadotimus and Raju. So in quantum mechanics, if I give you a state, that's all I get, need to give you to know about how to interpret it. I don't need to tell you where it came from or something like this. Um, yeah, any, any other questions from last time? Okay, um, I guess we can get started then. Uh, oh, this left, something, they didn't adjust all the boards. So let me pull this one down or get totally confused. Um, So in the, in the three Qtrit model, we saw that we could realize several of the interesting features of holography in a rather simple, exactly soluble setting. You know, we had um, commutativity at, in the radial direction in the bulk. Uh, we had subregion duality. We had uh, black holes and effective field theory, and it's all, it's all pretty good for a 27-dimensional Hilbert space. Um, but clearly it wouldn't be that interesting if there wasn't some general theory of what's going on there. You know, if this was all just an accident of the three Qtrit code, then who cares? Um, so what we're going to talk about starting today, so the first half of today, is some, some of the general theory of quantum error correction so that we can see that what happened in the Qtrit code isn't an accident. And it's the kind of thing that we should maybe expect to happen even in something so complicated as a holographic CFT. Um, and so I'll start by establishing two general results about quantum error correction, um, which characterize the structure that the code subspace needs to have um, as a subspace of the full Hilbert space uh, in order for error correcting to work. And then we'll try to apply those general results to holography and see that indeed uh, they seem to be consistent with what we expect from the bulk. Um, so I'll start, so now the next maybe half hour or so is gonna be sort of, is just mathematics. We're gonna be discussing the proof of a theorem about the structure of quantum error correcting codes. Um, so we might call this the structure theorem. Um, of, for later reference, what I'll call standard um, quantum error correcting codes. And again, here I, I'm specifically thinking of correcting erasures, so dealing with errors where you, the error is that there's just some subsystem you don't have access to, and you want to know what you can still find out about the encoded message. Um, so, So the setup we're going to consider is that we have a code subspace which is sitting inside of a larger Hilbert space which tensor factorizes into HR and HR bar, okay? Now in the ADS CFT setup, you should think of this as being like the degrees of freedom in a region R and this being like the degrees of freedom in the, in the complement of the region. Now, I know you've all just been indoctrinated that this tensor product doesn't really exist in quantum field theory, and that's true. And so the final statements of these theorems will be algebraic. 
But uh, since it's new for most people, it's always better to first do it in the simplest setting possible. And then I may, at the end of the next time, we'll, we'll discuss some of the algebraic versions of how to say these things. Um, OK, so, so this is the setup. We have a code subspace of some tensor product Hilbert space. Um, and then the theorem says that, um, says that the following four things um, are equivalent. And the, these four things are going to be sort of different ways of formalizing this idea that the code can correct for the loss of R bar. So in this whole discussion, R is going to be the region that we have access to, and its complement R bar is going to be the region that we don't have access to. Um, so we'll probably fill up two of these boards with all of the things. So the first thing is that for every operator O tilde on H code, so in the last lecture, we called these logical operators. Um, there exists an operator OR on HR, so an operator with non-trivial support over here. And so again, this has a tensor product with the identity here, which I'm not going to write. Um, so such that um, um, if we act with OR, oh, sorry, let me first say, such that for all states, psi tilde, which are in the code subspace, um, if we act with OR on psi tilde, we get the same thing as had we acted with O tilde, um, and the same for the Hermitian conjugates. Uh, so I'll write it small here, but it's just the Hermitian conjugates, so it's OK. O tilde dagger psi tilde. Um, so this is the thing that we were talking about when we talked about bulk reconstruction last time. Right? It's saying that you have some operator that acts within this protected space. And actually, whichever operator you have here and whichever state in the code subspace you're acting on, um, there's a representation of this operator just here. And to be clear, that representation, it's the same for whichever state you pick. It's not a state-dependent representation. It's actually a little hard to read this. Yeah, OK. Um, let me see. I think what I can do about that. Um, well, OK, I guess I can roll over onto the next board. And then I can just drop one line. OK, so for every O tilde on H code, there exists an OR just on HR such that for all psi tilde in H code, we have that um, OR acting on psi tilde is equal to O tilde, oh, sorry, O tilde acting on psi tilde and um, OR dagger acting on psi tilde is equal to O tilde dagger acting on psi tilde. OK. So every logical operator can be represented just on R. So, so that may or may not be true. The theorem is not saying that this is true. The, the theorem is saying that if this is true, then there are three other things that are also true and vice versa. OK. So I have to tell you the other three things to have a theorem. Right now, I don't have a theorem. But this is hopefully recognizable as the statement that we were talking about last time. So for example, in the three Qtrit code, R could have been the first and second Qtrit. And this would be saying that our logical operator O tilde on H code can be represented just on the first and second Qtrit, or the second and third, or the first and third, for that matter. OK. Um, now. There's the second condition. We're going to use all the boards by the time we state the theorem. Um, it says that for every operator x r bar on h r bar, um, if we take the projection onto the code subspace, which I'll call p, and we conjugate x r bar by this, um, then we get an operator which is just proportional to the projection onto the code subspace. OK, so again, I remind you, P is the projection onto the code subspace. So this says whatever operator we have on the region that's erased, the region we don't have access to, 
that if we project it onto the code subspace, we just get something that's proportional to the identity on the code subspace. All right. So, so this is kind of plausible. It's saying that you can't learn anything about the state of the code subspace by doing measurements on R bar, okay? Which is good, because we're trying to say we can recover from the loss of R bar, okay? And so now we have a theorem, because I'm saying these two things are equivalent, but I'm not done. I want to say the other two things. Okay, so that's condition two. Condition three, um, so if we define a state phi which lives in a larger Hilbert space where we take a tensor product of our HR times HR bar with an auxiliary system which has the same dimensionality as the code subspace, then I can prepare the following state. And so it'll be more clear once I write the state, the words I just said. So I'll call the auxiliary system S. And then this I tilde is a basis for the code subspace. Okay. So what I'm doing is I'm maximally entangling the code subspace with some reference system that has the same dimensionality. I can certainly always do that. Just introduce this extra system S. Oh, I wrote a three there. That's wrong. This is the dimensionality of S. Okay. So, okay, so far that's not a condition. It's a definition. But now the claim is that in this state, so in this state, if we look at the reduced density matrix on S and R bar in the state phi, it's actually a tensor product into the state on S and the state on R bar. Okay, that's the third condition. This one, again, is kind of plausible. Basically, so it's saying that there's no correlation between operators that are in the system which you don't have access to, this R bar, and operators that are logical operators. Because roughly speaking, any logical operator um, on this code subspace can be mirrored to an operator acting on this uh, subsystem by taking the transpose and vice versa. So if you like, this subsystem is just sort of keeping track of all of the information in the code subspace. Um, yeah, yeah, it's basis, it's basis dependent. Well, sorry, the, I, I made a choice of a basis here, but doing local unitaries on the different factors is not going to change this. Yeah. Um, OK. And now finally, good, the longer one, the last one is a bit longer to say, so it's good I'll write on the longer board. Um, so um, the fourth thing that these are all supposed to be equivalent to is that, um, well, first of all, the dimensionality of the auxiliary system, which is also the dimensionality of the code subspace, has to be less than the dimensionality of the region that we have access to. This somehow clearly needs to be necessary, because how could we possibly recover the information onto R if R doesn't even have a big enough dimension to host the code subspace? Um, and moreover, um, we, can de we can decompose HR into a tensor product, HR1 tensor HR2, direct sum H R3, um, such that um, the dimensionality of R1 is equal to the dimensionality of S, and the dimensionality of R3 is less than the dimensionality of S. Now, let me just comment that I, this decomposition is always possible because um, whatever the dimensionality of HR is, I can divide by the dimensionality of S with remainder, doing long division. And that's basically what's going on here. So this is like the remainder of that long division. And you know that when you do the remainder in division by S, the remainder is less than S. OK. Um, so, so this is always possible. Uh, but OK, so far I still haven't made a statement. So well, I guess that's a statement, but an obvious one. Um, but, but now the, the claim is that um, there exists 
a unitary operator, UR on HR, and there exists a state, chi, living in the Hilbert space of R2 and R bar, such that a complete basis, or any complete basis, for the code subspace has the form where we just act with UR on a state where we put I onto the, this first, this tensor factor here. Uh, oh, sorry, this is R1. The first tensor factor there. Um, chi R2 R bar, okay? And so if you remember from the last lecture, this is the kind of formula we wrote in the 3Qtrit code, right? We said that there was an encoding map where we had some state chi, which was shared between the system we don't have access to and some piece of the system we do have access to. And then we fed the logical state into the rest of the part of the system that we have access to. And then there was some sort of entangling or scrambling or whatever you, you want to call it, unitary, acting just on the system that we have access to, okay? So this theorem is saying that this special structure that we had for the 3Q trait code is the structure that you always have, okay? That you, uh, anytime you have a situation where you can represent all of the logical operators on the subsystem R, it's going to be because the state has the state, the encoded states have this structure. Yeah? What? Condition which, three? Yeah, all the conditions are equivalent. Yeah, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm actually gonna prove the theorem because I think the tools are educational and you should all see them. Um, yeah, so we're, we're, gonna show, we're gonna show that these are all equivalent. And so that's gonna take a little while, but I think it's worth it. Okay, so there are any questions about the statement of the theorem? It, it, maybe let me also add, so this one also should be quite plausible because this one is basically saying that you can recover the state just onto R, right? So, so, so the first one says you can recover the operators. This one says you can recover the states. This one says that there are no measurements on R bar which tell you about the code subspace, and that's also basically what this one says. So it's kind of plausible that these are all the same. All right, let's see if I can do better this time. Yeah. Okay, all right, so, let, so, so let's, uh, let's do the proof. Um, it's actually not that bad. Um, so I'll first show that one implies two, okay? So, um, so say there exists an XR bar such that P XR bar P is non-trivial um, on H code. Okay, so that's, that's saying that two is false, okay? Um, well, since this is a non-trivial operator on the code subspace, this would mean that there exists another operator, O tilde on the code subspace, um, such that, um, and well, let me, sorry. There exists O tilde on the code subspace and also a state, psi tilde, in H code, um, such that if we look at the expectation value of the commutator of O tilde with P X R P um, in psi tilde, that we get something that's not zero. Uh, and so that's just Schur's lemma, right? Schur's lemma says that any operator on the code subspace which is non-trivial can't commute with all of the operators on the code subspace. We sort of already used that once in a different guise last time. And so in particular, there'll be some operator on the code subspace which it doesn't commute with. And then since the commutator is a non-trivial operator, not zero, we can find some state uh, in which its expectation value is non-zero, okay? Um, but this, so you see here the P is always acting to the left or to the right on a state that's in the code subspace. So this is actually just equal to psi tilde, the commutator with O tilde of X R bar in psi tilde. Um, but we assume condition number one, 
which says that every logical operator can be, one sec, can be represented on OR, including this one, but then these guys are acting on different tensor factors, so we get zero, uh, and so there's a contradiction here. Uh, yeah, there was a question? Well, no, by definition, the algebra of operators that act on the code subspace is an algebra, right? It's the set of, you know, it's the set of block diagonal matrices, if you like, in the Hilbert space. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, yeah, we can take them to be zero on the other block. Yeah. Okay, so that shows that one implies two using Schur's lemma. Um, now let's see that two implies three. So three, remember what we want to show is that um, we have a product state in this extended state phi where we entangle the code subspace with the reference system. And then when we look at the subspace, the state on S and R bar, we have a product state. So anytime you want to show that you have a product state, one way of doing it is just showing that all of the correlation functions are zero between the two systems. Uh, so that's what I'm going to do. So indeed, um, in the state phi, I can look at the two-point function of an arbitrary operator OS on um, the reference system with an arbitrary operator X R bar on the erased system. Now, since we're assuming condition two, this can be replaced with P X R bar P. Well, that's always true because this is acting on the code subspace. But then that means it's actually proportional to the identity, right, by condition two, which means that this is equal to phi OS phi times phi P X, ah, X R bar P phi. Okay, because this is just a C number, so I just pulled that C number out of the expectation value and call it this, right, because phi is normalized. Um, but then you see here I can get rid of the P's. So this just says that this product, this expectation value of the product is equal to the product of the expectation values of the one-point functions for any OS and XR bar, okay? So indeed, the correlation function is, the connected correlation function is zero because we subtract the product of the one point functions. All right. Now, the hard part, as you might have guessed, is showing that three implies four. You know, because four was a little bit complicated. We have these restrictions on the dimensionalities and so on. So the, the way this is going to work is I have to use the Schmidt decomposition, which Edward uh, reviewed in his first lecture, I believe. And so what the Schmidt decomposition tells you is that any time you have a, a pure state of a bipartite system, that the number of non-zero eigenvalues of the density matrix on one side is equal to the number of non-zero eigenvalues of the density matrix on the other side. Um, and moreover, it tells you that if I have some mixed state of a system and it's purified on some other system, then any such purification, all possible purifications of a given mixed state onto another system differ only by a unitary transformation on that system because I can just move around those Schmidt vectors that Edward wrote in the decomposition of the state. So I'll use both of these things as the proof goes on, but I want to say them in front so they're not surprising when we get to them. Okay, so first we note that, uh, we note that phi um, purifies um, rho r bar s. Okay, that's by definition because I, defined it, well, I, I, maybe I switched the order, sorry, uh, S R bar, whatever. Um, and so this means that the dimensionality of R 
um, has to be greater than or equal to the dimensionality of S times the rank of rho r bar. Because um, if this were not true, then there wouldn't be enough states in R to purify this product state. And remember, rho s, we know what it is. It's just maximally mixed. Okay, so, uh, so that just gives us an s, this s here. And then rho r bar may not be maximally mixed, but it has some rank, and that's what we have to put here. So um, already this tells us that, um, that s has to be less than or equal to r bar, which, to r, which is the first thing I wrote up there. Right? OK, so, so far that's easy. Um, and moreover, um, by this long division argument, so, so we can take, um, we can always write r as a number equal to some other number r2 times s plus some remainder, which is less than s, because we're just dividing r by s. Um, then we, ha we can have this decomposition up here that I wrote um, with, the, with the restrictions that I said. Um, finally, um, we can use this to tell us that the rank of rho r bar um, has to be, well, just using this and this, it has to be less than or equal to um, so here I'm just writing the same inequality again, um, which is equal to R2 plus R3 over S. Um, but remember, so by this long division, R, this dimensionality of R3 is less than the dimensionality of S, which means that this thing here is less than 1. And since these things are integers, this can't possibly be true unless um, the rank of rho r bar uh, is less than or equal to r2. OK? Now, this is important because what this tells us is that rho r bar can be purified on r2, right? Because any time that the, if the dimensionality of this density matrix is less than the dimensionality of R2, then we can find a set of orthogonal states here to pair up with the eigenvalues of rho R bar in the Schmidt decomposition. OK? So th this implies that we can purify rho R bar um, as the trace over R2 of chi chi for some state chi in R2 R bar. Now we're almost done. Sorry, this one is a little bit tedious, like I said. Um, so now we just note that a purification of our rho s R bar is given by the following state. Um, we have a sum on i. I s i r one chi r two r bar. So the the point of this counting and so on was to show that we can purify r bar just on r two, and then this clearly is going to purify the state that I wrote here because we assumed it had this product structure. Um, and now finally, we use the fact I said at the beginning, which is that if we have two different purifications of the same density matrix on the same system, they have to differ at most by a unitary transformation on that system, which means that phi, which is also a purification of rho r bar s, has to be equal to a unitary on r acting on phi hat. And that's our condition that we wrote. So that's a sort of practical illustration of the power of the Schmidt decomposition. Now finally, to show that 4 implies 1 is easy, we can just do it right here. 
Okay, so for that, we just do the obvious thing. So we define OR to be, um, to be a UR, OR, UR dagger. And you see then acting up here, right, it just it undoes the UR there. And then we act with whatever logical operator we want on R1. So really, this is OR1. Uh, and then we re-encode. Uh, with another UR. Okay, so that, that concludes the proof. Ah, I forgot to push harder. Um, that concludes the proof of the theorem. Um, since it was a bit technical, I just want to draw a picture that, so that you can kind of keep the conclusion of the theorem in your head without having to remember all these statements. Um, maybe I'll try this. Um, so what this theorem is really saying is that any quantum error correcting code, at least of this sort of standard kind, has the structure where you, you take the state that you want to encode, um, and then you take this, this state chi, so, and then you feed this into R1, and you feed this into R2, R bar, and then as a quantum circuit, this is an entangled state, well, or I didn't show that it has to be here, but usually it is. Um, and then the encoding just works like that, OK? So you, you start with the message, you take the tensor product with some extra state, and then you act with the unitary on the region that you have access to, OK? And every quantum error correcting code, at least of this kind, is going to have that structure. All right. So any questions about this? Sorry, it's a little bit technical. Yeah. In this technique, you use that proportional to feed, but it looks like you use that proportional to x. That, that, so that I use that what? Oh, it's proportional to x um, r bar factor. Oh, you mean in, the, in, uh, the, in this proof? Yeah, yeah. So, so, so uh, yes, sorry. Um, so, no, so here I can, I, can, I can replace xr by p xr bar p just because the p is acting here or here on a code state, so it does nothing. Yeah. And then where I used that condition was where I, re I said, oh, this is equal to some number times the identity. Let's call it lambda. And then I observed that another way of writing lambda is like this. And then I said, oh, but now I can get rid of the p's again. Yeah. Um, OK. So, yeah, yeah, sorry, go ahead. What? What? What is the what of it? The intuition? Utility. Oh, utility. Well, it, yeah, good. So it, it allows you to put the whole, it allows you to talk about the entire code subspace just talking about this one state. Oh, well, yeah, so I could have, um, so here I fed in some particular state psi, but I could have instead just entangled this factor with s over here, and then I would have gotten a circuit that prepares my state phi. Here I wanted to write the circuit that prepares the actual encoded state for whichever state you're interested in, yeah. But this trick of sort of purifying on an auxiliary system is something that, you know, no quantum information theory paper is written that doesn't do that at some point to a first approximation, although I'm sure there's some counterexamples. Because it's just very convenient. It allows you to replace talking about the individual states to, it allows you to talk about the whole subspace at once, just talking about one state. Yeah. There was another question somewhere? Yeah. Oh, no, no, so phi I can always, phi is, this is just the definition of phi. We have our code subspace, and so I can always purify it on some reference system. And then the statement is that that state that I get has this structure. And it won't if you just pick a, a stupid subspace. You know, you have to, it has to be a good subspace in order to have this product structure. Yeah. Okay, um, so that, that's the first of the two general results I wanted. The, the second one is basically going to use this, so don't worry, it's, we're, we're not going to go through another proof like that. Um, so 
The second result I wanted to talk about was I want to, we, I want to get some sense of how big does the code subspace need to be, or can it be, right? So somehow we know that we need redu you know, redundancy in order to have the information be well protected. Um, and you might guess, for example, that if you want to protect a really big message, you need a, a lot of physical qubits, right? Or you might think that you know, the bigger the erasures you want to protect against, the more physical qubits you need. Uh, and so the second result I'll describe is called the quantum singleton bound, and it's kind of an inequality that um, formalizes that intuition. Uh, so, however, um, I need to make a, a small assumption. So you may remember in the lecture this morning, um, we saw that in order for this structure to be present simultaneously for different choices of r and r bar, we needed that this state chi is very entangled. And actually, in this proof, I didn't say anything about that because the regions were fixed. So somehow, the real meat of quantum error correction is you want all these to be true simultaneously for different choices of r and r bar. Uh, and that's a statement about how chi has to be entangled. Um, so in particular, I'm now just going to sort of assume that this state chi has the property that its reduced state on R bar is full rank. If this were not true, then I can just sort of throw out the states, uh, which are null in the null space of rho R bar, uh, since they never show, since they're sort of orthogonal to everything in the code subspace, so they're kind of irrelevant. Okay. So if we do assume that R bar has full rank, um, then what that tells us is that, so if rho r bar has full rank, then um, in order for it to be purified on r2, we need that r2 has to be greater than or equal to the dimensionality of r bar, OK? So that, that's kind of like this inequality that we had here before, except now this is full rank. Um, and this actually constrains the sizes of the various tensor factors. Um, so in particular, we can see that the dimensionality of R, which is equal to the dimensionality of R2 times the dimensionality of S plus the dimensionality of R3, um, well, surely this is greater than just the dimensionality of R2 times S, because this is positive. Um, and then by this inequality, we see that this has to be greater than or equal to the dimensionality of R bar times S. And this is what's called the singleton bound. Um, so let me now try to interpret that. But first, I have to do some erasing. Yeah, R3 is kind of a, a relic of us being in finite dimensions. It's this annoying fact that S might not quite divide the, the dimensionality of R. So in infinite dimensions, you wouldn't worry about that. And actually, even if you have systems where everything are qubits, you also never have to worry about it, because any smaller power of 2 always divides a larger power of 2. So, so usually people don't even discuss the R3 at all. It's just I, I inflicted it upon myself because I didn't want to talk about qubits. Yeah. Although I'm actually now about to talk about qubits, but I, I wanted to give the general theorem first. Um, so indeed, say that we want to. So say that we want to encode k um, logical, and actually I'll call them q dits. So a q dit is a d state qubit. So we met q trits last time. That's d equals three. And there, but in general, you could have more. That's just to show that there's nothing special about qubits here. 
So if we have k logical qubits and we have n um, physical qubits, um, and we want to, and we imagine that we have uh, we have m uh, qubits um, we can access. Okay, so then the, the dimensionality of R is d to the m, and the dimensionality of the whole thing is d to the n, and the dimensionality of the code subspace is d to the k. And so then what the singleton bound tells us is that d to the m has to be greater than or equal to d to the n minus m times d to the k, um, which is equivalent to saying that m has to be greater than or equal to m uh, uh, has to, m has to be greater than or equal to n plus k over 2. Okay. And, and this is hopefully a bit more intuitive. So let's think about what this inequality really says. Um, it's, first of all, so k is positive. So an n over 2 is half of the total physical qubits. So this is saying that if you want to access the message, you need access to at least half of the physical qubits, right? Because if k were 0, we would have n over 2. And then actually with k not 0, it's only bigger. right? And then in fact, it says as k gets bigger, so as the message gets bigger, we need access to an even larger fraction of the qubits in order to be able to read the message. Okay? And so that, that's kind of what you would expect, right? at least at the level of all the signs and maybe even the 2. Now, um, oh, we can, we can check, by the way, that this is true for the three Qtrit code. Uh, so let's do that together. So for the three Qtrit code, um, n is three, because there are three Qtrits. k is one, because there's one logical Qtrit. So on the right-hand side, we have, um, we have three plus one over two is two. And then on the left-hand side, we need access to two of the Qtrits, and indeed, that's what we have. So this inequality is saturated for the three Qtrit code. So it's good we derived it with the equal sign. Um, the other comment I want to make is actually, although this can, I'm essentially arguing that this condition is a sort of necessary condition. If you choose the, the code subspace randomly, it actually turns out to be a sufficient condition. So if I choose a code subspace where the, these are, uh, this inequality is obeyed I, and I choose it randomly, then uh, to accuracy, which is exponentially good in the violation of this, uh, the code is going to be correctable to a good approximation. Um, so somehow, this is sort of generically what you should expect. Uh, you should sort of generically expect correctability once you're on the right side of this inequality. Is there a question? Is there anything specifically special about the saturation? Um, yeah, I mean, it's kind of. So these codes, like the three Qtrid code, are very special codes. They're what, they're what are called stabilizer codes. And they have a certain discreteness to them. So there's a way of presenting them where you just talk about um, uh, the sort of group theory of discrete groups. And so since they're, they don't really have room to miss by a little bit, so, so it's kind of a good way of getting something that just barely works. Uh, and, and a lot of the sort of popular stabilizer codes have that property that they just barely work. Um, they seem also to be the, the most efficient ones that you can use to encode this information, right? Or... Um, yeah, well, so you could certainly, it depends what you mean by efficient, but in some sense you could say that saturating this inequality is the definition of, of being the most efficient. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, sort of encoding the most information with the least physical qubits protected against the most possible errors somehow. OK, so enough with the linear algebra. Um, now we can go back to ADS-CFT and try and apply these things. So as we discussed in the beginning, um, there's always some choice in how you define a code subspace. So let me start with an especially simple choice, uh, just so that we can get started. And then we'll think later about 
whether that's really the code subspace we actually want. And so, so now we're, now we're going to say some general properties of holographic codes. So the code space I'll consider is the one where it's spanned by states where I start with the vacuum, and then I have some sphere in the center of the bulk whose size is of order the ADS radius. And then I'm allowed to act with a, um, k local operators in the bulk somewhere in that sphere. So, so there are k bulk operators in the center. So that's some set of states in the Hilbert space of the CFT. For example, we could reconstruct those operators using the methods we talked about last time and then prepare these states. Um, now, the dimensionality of this code subspace will then be exponential in K um, since you can you know, choose to act or not act with each of the K operators. So it's up to K operators. Um, and even for each one, there's kind of a choice where exactly you put it. We have to coarse grain those things a little bit, but don't worry about it. Let's just say that it's exponential in K. I won't try to say what the coefficient in the exponent is. Um, but in order to apply the singleton bound, so, so then this K here is something like the K there. It's the dimensionality of the code subspace, the log of the dimensionality of the code subspace. But in order to apply the bound, I need to say something about what is N, little n. I need to say what is the full dimensionality of the Hilbert space. And now you're all probably thinking, I mean, come on, Harlow, you know, you idiot. Um, in quantum field theory, we all know that n is equal to infinity because there are infinitely many degrees of freedom in a quantum field theory. Okay, and that's true. But actually, most of those degrees of freedom are not activated in this subspace because we just have a few low energy excitations in the center of the bulk. And so most of the degrees of freedom of the quantum field theory have to do with what's, you know, things that are going on in the deep UV and have nothing to do with this state. And in fact, one way of thinking about that is that these smearing functions that we talked about last time where you, where you put in the operators here, they vary on the boundary, sort of on the scale of the boundary sphere, but not at scales that are parametrically small compared to that, at least not, not if the bulk points are in the center. If we start moving the bulk points towards the boundary, then it's different, but remember, we're just keeping the ones in the center here. So in order to describe this Hilbert space, roughly speaking, we can just say that we take the CFT on the sphere and we coarse grain it into cells, you know, such that, I don't know, maybe there's a million cells on the sphere, okay? And then in each one of those cells, there's a matrix worth degrees of freedom. So we should expect that what we should actually think of n as being is something like number of cells, um, which is large but order one, times uh, what I'll call n squared, the number of degrees of freedom per site. So in n equals four super young mills, it would actually be n squared. And here I'll just call it n squared, uh, or you might want to call it c, you might want to call it uh, n cubed in some examples, but it's, it's the number of degrees of freedom per site, so I'll just call it n squared. Okay, now we can start applying the singleton bound. So we can ask, okay, how much of the boundary should we need to have access to in order to be able to recover information in the center? Um, well, let's first consider the case where k is order one. So, so say, let's say k is order one. And now when I say order one, order anything, I always mean in this n, okay? So it's order n to the zero, big n to the zero. Um, so then in, if you look at this inequality up here, then it means k is totally irrelevant because it's sitting next to little n, which was proportional to big N squared, okay? So then this inequality would just be telling us that we need to have access to at least half of the boundary in order to know what's going on here. Um, and that's actually true. That's what the ads rindler reconstruction tells us, right? It, it tells us that if we have some operator in the center, if in the boundary we have access only to this region which is less than half, right, then the causal wedge does something like this and we can't access this information. Whereas if we instead have, extend our region all the way out to here, then the causal wedge does contain the interior and then we know what's going on. So at least it seems that the singleton bound is consistent 
with what we found with the ADS Rindler reconstruction. Now you can say, OK, fine, that works for k of order 1, but now let's start ramping up k. Well, as we make k bigger for a while, nothing is going to change because it's still sitting next to that big n squared there. And so we'll still predict that we still just basically need half of the system in order to reconstruct the interior. But when k reaches, becomes of order big n squared, well, then it now starts actually mattering in this bound. Uh, and things that we were previously able to reconstruct were now not able to reconstruct. Um, and that's actually good from the point of view of the bulk, because what the bulk says when you act with a bunch of operators here, which is a, a number of order n squared of them, it tells you that actually what happens here is that there's a big black hole. Right? This is precisely when you start having enough states in the code subspace that you're competing with the entropy of a big black hole sitting in the center of the space. Um, and so if you like, this is a kind of justification of what I said at the end of the last lecture, which is that the states that are not in the code subspace, the states where the quantum error correction breaks down, should be understood as arising because the observable that you're talking about ended up being somewhere where there was a black hole. Um, Yeah. No, yeah, it's, we, it, I don't, I'm not sure if I want to call it a phase transition because we're not changing anything about the theory, but it's some kind of fairly sharp transition, kind of like what happens in Page's theorem that somebody talked about on it, I think. Um, yeah, I mean, the way I like to think about this is that, um, you know, the CFT comes to you and it says, you know, you think that I'm a, a d-dimensional CFT, but actually I'm a theory of quantum gravity in d plus one dimensions. And you look at the CFT and you say, no, come on. <laughs> and it says, OK, try me. So you start asking it for correlation functions. And uh, it, it, it gives them to you. And wh what do you know? They keep reproducing the effective field theory of uh, matter coupled to gravity in, in asymptotically ADS space. And you do it, you keep going, and you keep giving it more correlation functions. And you know, say, God, what is, what is I, I know it's just a, a d dimensional CFT. You know, I'm, so you say, OK, I know about the singleton bound. So I'm going to ask you for a complicated enough bulk observable that there's just no way that you can continue to pretend that you're really a higher dimensional theory. Okay? And right when you know, I've really got it against the wall, you know, and it knows that it's just, it can't, it can't continue to pretend that it's a, it's a local theory in d plus 1 dimensions, then it says, ah, oh, no, but you forgot. I, I'm a gravity theory, and so I made a black hole. <laughs> and somehow, that's, that's the key thing, right? Like all these paradoxes I talked about last time, they were proofs that quantum field theory in d dimensions can't be equal to quantum field theory in d plus 1 dimensions, you know, which if there's anything that's holy, probably that should be true. Um, but somehow gravity is the loophole, right? It's because if you kind of push it too hard to the point where it can't you know, continue to pretend being local, then it has black hole formation to take advantage of. Yeah? So in this language, uh, it's not very clear to me how should I think about uh, uh, states that have a small number of operators but that have big enough energy to form the black hole uh, anyway. Yeah, so, so, so here I'm talking about operators that are dual to local fields in the bulk. So of course in the CFT there are high dimension operators where if you just act with them they, they create some black hole. What I'm saying is that I could, I could take just two particles in the bulk and just uh, smash them at high enough energy so that they form a few black holes. Well, you don't, you don't, have, that, you don't have that here because I, I put them all in the center. So yeah, if, 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 if you let me put them way out near the boundary, then when they roll down the ADS potential, there can be a collision that makes a black hole. And then that's part of why I didn't allow you to put them out there. Yeah. Um, yeah, one sec. Yeah? So you, you seem to be going all the way down to the prime scale, but don't you expect some non locality at this gene scale? Or see? Uh, yeah, so I, di I didn't promise that you wouldn't see it sooner. This just tells you the limit. Yeah. So you, know, yeah, you might have string theory or something that comes in at a parametrically lower scale. I'm not ruling that out. Um, yeah. The volume of the sphere is very large compared to one. 
Yeah. Uh, don't you still need just half the safety to um, see the Oh, good. Yeah. yeah. Um, no, so if the thing is, once the operators start not being in the center, then this thing I said about the cells stops being true because there I needed that things were varying smoothly on the side of the sphere, right? So if the, if the smearing functions uh, are very rapidly as a function of angle, then I need more cells at the places where that happens. So in some sense, it's still half, but it's not in terms of, you know, the, you saying half in terms of the boundary metric is sort of picking a conformal frame, which I did by going to the center. Yeah. Um, there was another question? Yeah. yeah. What? Oh, you mean capital N instead of capital N squared? Yeah, so here I would be saying nothing happens, or at least nothing needs to happen. Yeah. Because capital N is still small compared to capital N squared. Yeah. Um, um, well, it could have been, but I have the whole subspace, so I could have a mixed state black hole. Sorry, you're asking, sorry, I, I'm not, sorry, I, I, I think nothing I said matters whether it's pure or mixed. No, no, I'm just saying in the top picture, you do an operator in the center. Yeah. And more, just slightly more than half of the number to get it. Yeah, yeah. Now we have a horizon in the middle, and the idea is you need like two thirds or something to get an operator in the middle. Well, we're not even, sh yeah, um, maybe. I mean, I, I'm not sure, I don't want to commit right now to, to how exactly to think about the states where there are black holes. I may comment on that at the end of the lecture, but I, I'd rather avoid the confusion. It, it, it's possible in some cases to include black holes in the code subspace and have it make sense, but I don't want to try and talk about it now. Um, OK, any other questions? Oh, yeah, in the back? Yeah. No, I, I know, so, but I, I sort of used this idea. Uh, the only thing I used was that row R bar has full rank. So, so uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, a, a, as you get further away from the center, though, I really think this argument I made about the cells is not correct. So, uh, you know, and, there's, and, and even in the center, there's some wiggle room. So I'm not trying to claim that everything is precise here. It's just the scaling that's interesting. No, I know. So, that, but, but remember, I, I well, no, I, I don't think there are things right. So, so I mean, you, you can okay. What about something here, right? Can I sort of get it with less than half, right? You can you can say that. But somehow that has to do with the fact that this guy is sort of not quite varying uniformly on the cells. I I, I don't want to commit to saying that I have a quantitative theory of that. Um, yeah. Uh, so, uh, how, how uh, if we consider a uh, long one problem? Uh, in uh, thermal flow down. Yeah. Uh, then there's some region uh, in the entanglement, but not in the causal way. Yeah. Which should be uh, characterized by uh, uh, bound one side boundary data rectified by this argument. Yeah. But then this means like uh, uh, more states are not uh, accumulated uh, near uh, the horizon, even in the horizon. But so there is other bound. Like I mean, so what, once the so in the states like you're describing, you're you're sort of necessarily in this situation where back reaction is important and things are going to. I mean, this is just the simplest possible setup. Uh, I, I mean, we can we can complicate it in many ways, but I, I don't want to address every possible complication now. The question is more like if k is let's say alpha times n, where alpha is less than one, then the bounds would seem to tell you that if you enough of the CFP, you still get operators inside the horizon. Oh, no, I think inside the horizon, you're, you're really stretching it. I, I don't want to, I mean, if you want to talk about inside the horizon, we have to be much more precise about how the operators are addressed and so on, so we know what we're really talking about. Uh, that's a true statement, assuming that this R bar has full rank, right? Um, but, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, uh, I, th so that statement is rigorous, but then this thing where I said that we can estimate n like the cells and so on, I mean, now it's getting a bit, uh, it's, it's kind of more meant to be a sort of motivational. Um, 
Yeah, no, I, mo mostly this is just supposed to justify parametrically this idea that, that it's black holes that are the thing that cause you, that you sort of start causing trouble with the code subspace. That's, that's the only real conclusion I wanted from this. I mean, clearly there's more to life than the singleton bound that we'll have to know if we want to get the details right for everything. Okay, um, good. Now, um, yeah. So still, in, if we consider a thermal double state, yeah. then the M is uh, uh, just a one side, and the N is uh, twice of M, right? In that case, which does that mean that using one side data, we cannot uh, uh, reconstruct anything because um, in the thermo it, so in the thermo field double, it's true that you can't see anything behind the horizon with only one side because there can be signals that come from the other side. Oh, okay, so so here the cold space is not uh, any uh, excitation um, in the <coughs> entangled wedge, but uh, the things inside the horizon. Let's talk about it later. I don't want to debug every single example on on the fly. Um, Okay, so um, I, I just want to make now two other comments. Um, let me see. Um, oh, I, I think I need to, where did I put, oh, here it is. Okay, so let me, let me make sort of two more general comments and then we'll, we'll discuss another example. Um, so, <clears throat> so one fun comment to make is that, you know, when I was a graduate student, there was always this question, what is the radial direction in the bulk? And it was supposed to be this mysterious thing. And sometimes people would talk about, oh, it's the renormalization group flow. Um, and, you know, that's not, in some sense, that's not wrong. But actually, from, from this point of view, there's a much more precise answer to that question. Um, so if you think about just looking at what the ADS Rindler reconstruction is telling you, well, say that we have an operator near the boundary here. Um, and we ask, how big of a region of the boundary needs to be corrupted before we no longer can access what's going on at that operator? Or conversely, how big of a boundary region do we need to access it? Okay, and the thing is, this operator is not a very well protected operator, because you know I I can send my CFT you know in the mail lattice site by lattice site uh, to generalize what we did last time, and if this collection of envelopes here, let me try to make it blue, gets corrupted, well that's enough. It's in the causal wedge of that tiny little region. And so by using an operator just here, I can say flip a spin which is sitting there, which means that the information about this spin is not well protected in the boundary CFT. On the other hand, um, if we think about putting that spin in the center of the bulk, well, then it's actually rather well protected. So for example, we could imagine you know, some error where we lose access to this whole part of the boundary, which kills this whole part of the bulk, but actually our, our point is still fine, okay? And so the slogan, if you like, is that um, the radial direction um, is really quantified by the degree of protection. Um, and that's the sharp question. You know, you ask, what's the smallest region which can access this? Okay. So that's comment number one. Um, comment number two is that actually the kind of code subspace and error correction that we've been talking about so far is not really good enough for what we might really want in ADS CFT. Basically, the problem is that, well, if we want the code subspace to be the place where effective field theory is valid, then effective field theory surely is still valid um, if I act on the vacuum both with this operator and with that operator. But 
if we demand that every logical operator is protected against the erasure, then ADS-CFT is a terrible code because this operator is not very well protected, okay? So in the theorem, which I guess I erased, the whole idea was that we wanted any state in the code subspace or any logical operator to be recoverable onto R. But if we really are gonna demand that, it's going to be very constraining on the kinds of setups that we can talk about in ADS-CFT. So there's a much more natural thing, yeah. Uh, well, the only errors I talk about are where I don't, there's some subregion of the boundary that we don't have access to, and we know which subregion we don't have access to. Yeah. We can try to think about other error models, but they're usually not so interesting, right? Because that one is natural to ADS CFT. You know, you can say, like, oh, there are gremlins, and, you know, with probability P, they, they, they might corrupt these sites, or with probability Q, they might corrupt those sites, but it probably doesn't lead to anything interesting, at least as far as I can tell in ADS CFT. So I think the erasure is the natural error to consider. Yeah. Is there an analog to this slogan uh, in ADS2? Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, it's a little bit more confusing, though, because you don't have boundary subregions. So, yeah, I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, you, you probably, you, I, I, that's an important question. I, I, somehow you want to talk about subsets of the matrix degrees of freedom, but I don't, I don't know how to do that. Yeah. That, that, that's related to sub ADS locality, which is one of the puzzling things here. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's particularly natural. because The horizon involves the causal wedge, and as we'll see tomorrow, the entanglement wedge is really the right region to talk about for these kinds of questions. So I think it, you can, there, so if you talk about the so-called entanglement horizon, which is kind of the, the causal edge of the entanglement wedge, then that's the natural thing to talk about. Yeah. Um, which is good, actually, because horizons don't mean anything, right, locally, so, so. Uh, okay, so, um, so, so what we want, so yeah, so I was saying that, that if, if we really demand that every logical operator can always be reconstructed, then ADS-CFT is just gonna be a terrible code. So, so what we want is we want some generalization of what I talked about before, this theorem, uh, which is more naturally suited for ADS-CFT. And so the obvious thing to do, so a, so a generalization, um, and this is to what are called subsystem codes. Um, is that instead of asking for all the operators on the code subspace, we instead take the code subspace to have a tensor product structure, h little r, tensor h little r bar, sitting inside of the larger Hilbert space, h big r, tensor h big r bar. Um, and then what we ask is that every operator in h little r can be represented in h big r, and every operator in h little r bar can be represented in h big r bar. So, so let me draw a picture uh, in the bulk. So the idea is we split the boundary into a region R and its complement. Um, and then, well, eventually we're gonna be talking about the entanglement wedge, but for now we can pretend it's the causal wedge. Um, there's some region in the bulk here, little r, which is inside of the wedge for this guy. And there's some region over here, which is inside of the wedge for this guy. And then what we would, what the Rindler reconstruction would tell us is really going on is that every operator here goes here and every operator here goes there. Okay, and that's more natural than asking for all the bulk operators to go into one region. Now, um, so there's a, there's a natural generalization of the theorem that we proved before um, to this situation, but don't worry, I'm not going to prove it for you again, um, but I will draw the circuit picture that tells you the basic idea. So anytime you have this situation where every operator on H little r can go to H big r and vice versa for H little r bar and H big r bar, 
you can show that the encoding circuit actually has the following structure. Um, so there's a state chi, as before, um, yeah, R2, R2 bar, and then we feed in the state of h little of little r over here over there. We feed in the state of r little r bar over here, and then there are two unitaries. U r bar, um, and then coming out in the top here, we now have r um, r1, r2, r1 bar, and r2 bar. Okay. So it's kind of similar. I think I even have the picture over here, too. You see? So you can compare to this one. Right? So when you want all the logical states to be recoverable on R, then you have this sort of one-sided encoding. But where you want sort of some of the stuff to go to R and some of the stuff to go to R bar, then you need this double encoding, where the state chi is shared between the two sides, uh, but then the inputs go in separately on the two sides. Okay. And then, so we could spend another half hour proving this using exactly the same techniques and adding more symbols, but I'll spare you um, from doing that. You can look in my paper if you really want to see it. Uh, and you can also find the algebraic version there. Um, okay, so, so this is kind of the, the structure theorem for the subsystem codes, which are closer to what we want out of ADS CFT. All right. Um, Let's see, so now I'm supposed to go until 2.30, or 3.30, right? So 20 more minutes? Okay. So yeah, now, I, now I'm gonna switch gears and I'm gonna talk about um, another family of models. So, you know, it's a little bit annoying so far, right? So we have the three Qtrit code, and then we have full ADS CFT, you know, in N equals four super Yang Mills theory or something. And it would be nice if we had an example that was less trivial than the three Qtrit code but not as non-trivial as n equals four super Yang Mills, okay? And so I'm gonna spend the rest of this lecture using a tensor network to give you such an example um, where you can see all of this machinery in action uh, in a rather concrete way. Um, so here we go, tensor network models. But I'm sorry I'm being bad about references, but they're all in the notes, so you can go and see all the references. Um, okay, so the idea is that now we're gonna imagine having n, little n, um, physical uh, boundary qubits. So that's like our three qtrits that we had before. And then we're gonna have um, k, logical bulk qubits. Um, and the accomplishment of this model is that n and k are gonna be large, uh, sort of as large as we want, uh, so that we can get a volume's worth of degrees of freedom both in the bulk and in the boundary. So we can get a better sense of how locality is related in the two. Um, and I, so to give you the example, right, what I have to do is I have to tell you what's the code subspace. I have to tell you what are the two to the k, you know, what are the two to the k states that give a basis uh, for the logical qubit in terms of the Hilbert space of the physical qubits. So in other words, I owe you a wave function. I n j1 j k with a tilde. Um, and that's what I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you the wave function. Uh, and I'm going to give it to you in the form of some tensor, um, which just has all of these indices, has lots of indices, n plus k indices. Ah, you know, I have to push that up more. Okay, um, so uh, now I'm gonna give you this tensor 
in the form of a tensor network. And the idea of the tensor network, which I don't know, maybe no one has even mentioned them until now, surprising, but so, well, I wasn't here all of last week, but. Okay, so the idea of a tensor network is that you build a big tensor with a lot of indices out of a bunch of small tensors with a few indices by contracting their indices together in some complicated way, which you represent with a diagram. So just to give one simple example, um, I can take three tensors. So each tensor is indicated with a dot. And then the indices are indicated with lines. And then lines that go between dots denote indices that are contracted between the tensors. And lines which, uh, don't, which have only one endpoint on a dot correspond to free indices of the tensor. So for example, in this tensor, I could call this I1, I2, I3, J1, J2, um, I4, OK? And uh, if I tell you what these tensors are, then I've, then I've specified for you the big tensor. Um, and you just have to, so here there are three index contractions, K1, K2, and K3, OK? Um, now, the building block tensors, which I will use, um, are what are called perfect tensors. So a perfect tensor is a tensor with an even number of indices each of which has the same range, and moreover, which has the somewhat crazy property that any balanced bipartition, meaning any split of, into two equal parts of the indices, gives a unitary transformation. So for example, um, if T is a perfect tensor, uh, then, well, for one thing, it's unitary going up this way, but moreover, um, I can reroute this leg up here and reroute that one down here, um, and it's still a unitary transformation. And that's true whichever way you do the rerouting, as long as you get, end up with half and half, half going up and half going down. Um, now, it isn't obvious that perfect tensors exist, right? That's a lot of constraints for one poor little unitary to obey. Um, and in fact, generically, they don't. So if I, if I just tell you the range of the indices and I tell you the number of, of the indices, there may or may not be perfect tensors. They don't always exist. But they do sometimes exist. And in fact, we've met one already. Um, the one we met was the encoding uh, of the three Qtrit code. So if I define um, I1, I2, I3, J tilde, um, and I'm, so the, now these are four Qtrits. Then this is a tensor with four indices, I1, I2, I3, and J. Um, and actually, it's a perfect tensor. And so if you split it into any two, you get a unitary. And in fact, this U12 that we were talking about before is basically that unitary. Or we had U13, or we had U23. And those were the different ways of splitting the indices and always getting a unitary. Um, now, in fact, um, this perfect tensor um, is not the one I'm going to use. Uh, the three, the three, the four Qtrit tri perfect tensor is a little bit too trivial. Um, so the one I'm going to use instead is associated not to the three Qtrit code, but instead to another standard code, which is called the five qubit code. So um, there's a six index perfect tensor, which describes the encoding of one qubit into five qubits in a way where you protect against the erasure of any two of the five physical qubits. Um, and so we could go through. It's another one of these stabilizer codes that were mentioned before. So we could go through. I didn't want to have to go through the whole stabilizer formalism. So instead, I'll just ask you to trust me that there is a six index perfect tensor where each index is a qubit. Uh, and it comes from this code. And basically, perfect tensors always come from, from quantum error correcting codes. Um, now, I'm, I'm about to switch to slides. And actually, can you bring down the board? And I'll, I'll write over here for one sec while it's coming down. Um, so there's one final nice property of perfect tensors which is useful, um, which is that if you have an operator which is contracted with half of the indexes of a perfect tensor, 
So for example, oh, uh, I'm, uh. <laughs> yes, no. <laughs> well, okay, let's, I think you can see it. I think you can see it. Okay, great. Um, so say, say T is a perfect tensor, and I have some other tensor over here, which is an operator acting on half of the indices. Then since T is unitary, I can always replace this by um, a different operator, O prime, which is on the, other, on the other half of the indices of T. And you just do the obvious thing. This O prime is equal to T dagger OT, right? And so the T dagger eats this, and then you get back OT. And uh, the only thing special about the perfect tensor is you can do that for whichever three indices of the tensor the operator is being fed into. So any operator can be pushed from one half of the indices to the other half. All right. So, um, so those are the building blocks. Now to describe the network to you, um, I need the slides because uh, otherwise we'd spend the rest of the talk um, drawing pictures on the board. Oh, come on. So, uh, so here's the idea. So what we're going to do, um, once the projector is on anyways, um, well, I swear it was working before. Oh, I'm getting there. OK. So we're going to start with a, uh, a pentagon tiling of the hyperbolic plane. And so this is going to be a model. Huh? What? I, I, I didn't touch anything. Oh. This is very delicate. Yeah, yeah. I, I better not uh, try to stand very still. Uh, maybe it's not quite connected there. I don't know. Oh, yeah. I think it, yeah, actually, maybe push it in a little bit more. Well, th th these 10 minutes will become very metaphysical if I just talk about it with the black screen. Um, <laughs> some, something's happening. Oh, wait. Let's see, I, I wonder if the, is the problem on my end? I, well, okay, I try holding it like this. <laughs> okay. Now, hmm. um, this is very strange. Okay, it's working now. Okay, but you don't. Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> This is ridiculous. <laughs> Let me see. Um, <laughs> um, OK, well, maybe we'll have to do it the medical metaphysical. Well, I don't know, but that just ruins it. Um, how do, why do you know this has not happened before? <laughs> I wonder if I, should I unplug this maybe? Hmm. Okay, well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's try. Um, I'll, sp I'll talk fast. So we have this pentagon tiling of the hyperbolic plane, okay? And um, the idea is we have a six index perfect tensor. And what we're gonna do, all right, moment of truth, is that we're gonna stick one of those tensors in the center of each of those pentagons, like that. OK? So this red dot, oh, oops. This red dot uh, is the tensor. Um, and see, oh, now, now I'll just try and see. Uh, yeah. Um, OK. Uh, so, so you see each of these red dots, it has five indices. Um, and, but the tensor has six indices. So then the idea is that. One of those indices I'm going to view as an input index, which are the J indices I was talking about before. Those are the bulk indices. The remaining five are all contracted in the network like this until we get out to the edge. And then when we get out to the edge, then we just truncate the network and we say that all of the outgoing legs are the I indices, which are the boundaries, the, the describe the degrees of freedom in the boundary CFT. And so we can draw it like this. This is what happens when my collaborator draws the picture. 
Um, so now you see the red dots are the j's. They're the logical qubits. And the white dots are the i's. They're the physical qubits. And then this network is giving the map that tells you how a state in, that goes into the red qubits gets mapped to a state of the white qubits. Uh, so it tells us the code subspace. Is there a question? Yeah. How many j indices do you have in one ADS radius? One. Yeah. E each tensor has one qubit on each index. Yeah. OK. So now um, the fun thing about this is that we can immediately start seeing things like the ADS Rindler reconstruction. So OK, this picture I guess everyone saw. It's the logo for it from Qubit, but I'll still explain it. So um, if you have an operator acting on the dangling leg here, like this blue thing, well, you can say it's acting, for example, like the identity on these two legs. So it's an operator acting on half of the legs of the perfect tensor. So I can push it to an operator that acts on the other half, which are these three legs. And then each of those is going into yet another perfect tensor, and I can push it through again. And by the time I'm done, I get to an operator which is just living on these boundary legs here, which acts within the code subspace exactly as if I had just acted with the operator here on the logical qubit. Um, and moreover, I have quite a bit of freedom how to do it. So I chose to push it onto these three. But you know, I could have rerouted this one over here or you know, sent, you know, gone down here or over here. right? So you see, you really have the, this redundancy of the ADS Rindler reconstruction. And moreover, you have this property that if I instead have an operator over here, I can push it to a smaller region on the boundary. So you see this d connection between protection and the radial direction. Okay. Um, now, let me make the connection to the, the, to the picture I just drew, the encoding circuit, a little more concrete. So remember, this is going to be a, a subsystem error correcting code, because the red dots over here are recoverable here, and the red dots over here are recoverable here. Okay? And actually, so this green line, which by the way is the minimal surface, and we'll make a lot more out of that next time, um, the green line is the thing that divides between the two wedges. So that the state here on those black lines that are cut by the green thing is precisely this state chi that we were feeding in that was promised to us by the general theorem of quantum error correction. And then this UR is precisely the unitary that is the tensor network over here. You see this whole tensor network over here, I can view it as a map from the red dots together with the inputs coming through this green line to the boundary R. And it's precisely this UR. And similarly, the piece of the network here is precisely this UR bar. Okay? So here we can see sort of very geometrically this kind of rather abstract thing that we derive by doing linear algebra. Um, now, finally, I again want to talk about states that aren't in the code subspace. Uh, and so, as before, I'm going to try and convince you that those are black holes. Um, so one way to not have a get a state that's not in the code subspace is to just remove the central tensor. Sorry, I switched the tensors from red to blue. Um, so previously, I had one input going in here. But since I removed the tensor, everybody who it was attached to now has a new input. So now there are five inputs, these green inputs. And uh, so, so now, of course, one, two of the states I can feed in there correspond to just putting the tensor back, and there's no black hole. But the rest of the states I get going into these inputs, I interpret as the microstates of a black hole, which takes up one ADS region. And then you see we can keep going. We can remove more, you know, the next round of tensors. And then we get an even bigger code subspace. And we get a bigger black hole that has more microstates. But actually, all the while, out here, everything is still fine. So you know, this operator here, I can still push it here, or I can push it there. right? So somehow, most of the space time is OK, but I'm just losing the bit in the center. Um, but as I keep removing tensors, right, I keep, I keep uh, losing states. And, and before you know it, I've removed everything and recovered the entire Hilbert space of the boundary you know, by considering large enough black holes. And that, and that is actually what we think, right? Like the generic state of a CFT is some ridiculously large black hole you know, with infinite energy. Uh, and that's true. That is the generic state in this boundary Hilbert space. And here we're seeing how we can, well, not quite continuously, but sort of discreetly connect the two together by making the black hole bigger and bigger. Um, so you can see we can really get a sort of caricature of the entire Hilbert space of the duality, um, not just of the code subspace. And we can see that in the appropriate subspaces, we do get the bulk to emerge to greater or lesser degrees. OK, I think I'll stop here. And then next time, we'll talk about the Rutakinagi formula.